Welcome to Semantics. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor Trogot with us today. Actually, I plan not to waste any time to introduce such a big name in the field of linguistics. But since we have beginners who study their linguistic career in this new semester, I will spend a minute introducing Professor Trogot. Uh, Professor Trogot is Professor Emerita of Linguistics and English. She has done research in historical syntax, semantics, pragmatics, lexicalization, sociolinguistic linguistics, and linguistics and literature. She published widely, such as a, a History of Eng English Syntax, Grammaticalization, Regularity, and Semantic Change, to name just a few. So in today's talk, she will reconsider the relationship between subjectification, intersubjectification, and textualization from a constructionalist perspective. Now let me leave the precious time to Professor Trogot. Let's welcome her. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I appreciate your coming so early to listen. And let me say ahead of time what I will say at the end. I really welcome discussion, and uh, I hope we will have uh, quite a lot of things to talk about at the end. This is a this is a talk. Huh. This is a talk about semantic pragmatic change. It's about how functions associated with certain forms can come to be used over time with more attention to the speaker, writer, signer, that's subjectification, the hearer, reader, addressee, that's intersubjectification, and the text, which I understand as a cohesive stretch of language. And I call that process textualization. It's to talk about how working in a historical constructionalist mode has made me rethink the relationships between Sorry, these Professor Trogot, Are yeah. you going to share your screen? You're sharing your screen? Well, I'd like to, but I don't know how. <laughs> uh, so you, <clears throat> just as what you did just now, you can first put your PowerPoint on the desktop open your file and then you can share, start sharing. So I need to go back to square one, I guess. Yes. <clears throat> so open the file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, yeah. now what do I do? Share screen? Yes. I kind of thought, thought I did that, yes. Uh, it's working. Um, and then I get to the new slide. Uh, no new slide. No, I, no, no, no. Uh, the slideshow button. Yeah. If you... Okay, I'm, I have to start again because something went wrong there. Um, that's okay. See, I'm just... You have uh, the slideshow. Yeah, click the yeah. slideshow button. Near the arrow. I can't see it. It's um, not there. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the seventh near animations. So just near, yes, here, slide show. Sure. Oh, it's not that share. Um, so it's you are sharing. We can see the screen now. Yeah, here it says slide share. Yes. Okay. Play from. Mm -hmm. Try it again. Slideshow. Um, Click once. Play from, from, yes. play from current. Play from start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay, is, is that it? 
I, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I thought we had that all set up. No. Everything yes, is now. Yes, this is the cover page. Right. So I can go on. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, I'm going to start again. I'm sorry. I apologize to everybody who's there listening. I really thought I was in this, uh, uh, in the right place, but I wasn't. Okay, this is a talk about semantic pragmatic change, as I said. It's about how functions associated with certain forms can come to be used over time with more attention to the speaker writer signer, that is subjectification, the hearer reader addressee, that is intersubjectification, and the text, a cohesive stretch of language, which I call textualization. It's about how working in a historical constructionist mode has made me rethink the relationships between these processes. I've actually been thinking about the processes since the 1980s, so for a long time. But my view of how they are best conceptualized with respect to each other and to larger types of change, such as grammaticalization or constructionalization, has changed substantially. And I've moved on from positions characterized in various writings. I mentioned here Lopez, Coso, Visconti, and Brems, who all three uh, very well represented what I was aiming for back in the day. But um, I moved on from, <clears throat> from those uh, positions that I had. I'm going to argue that subjectification intersubjectification and textualization are three separate processes. They do not develop on a unidirectional climb, such as I proposed in 1982, and which has often been cited or repurposed or uh, alternative proposals have been discussed. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about them later. What I proposed in 1982 is in one, propositional, possibly to textual, and then to expressive. I'm going to claim that instead of working with a unidirectional client, we should think of the development of certain types of constructions and how, and that all these processes crystallize at the same time. That's the main point at the same time, rather than in some linear semiological succession. So my focus is on two questions. Is there evidence to support any of the several hypotheses about generalizable diachronic clients or continuum of subjectification, intersubjectification, and textualization? And second, how may we model the relationship between the three changes in terms of diachronic construction grammar, which is my current mode of research. To do this, I need some ingredients for the discussion. I need to uh, provide some background. I'm going to start with my current characterizations of subjectification, intersubjectification, and textualization. I'm going to glance briefly at Langacker's perspective on the process especially subjectification. I th suspect you're all familiar with Lang Acker's approach. Uh, and just to be sure that uh, um, I'm clear that I'm doing something very different from him, I will go through uh, primarily the differences between my approach and his. And then I'm going to talk about construction grammar and what a diachronic construction grammar approach to language uh, leads us to think about. I discussed these issues in uh, 10 lectures that I gave uh, last year and in a book called Discourse Structuring Markers in English, which I will refer to as Trial Got 2022. Uh, I did actually, uh, although I discussed the issues about 
diachronic construction grammar, I did not talk about subjectification and intersubjectification and textualization. Those are discussed in chapter 11 of the 2022 book. I talked about them in the context of the development of what I call discourse structuring markers, like after all, by the way, and now then. I'll come back to that term momentarily. And I'm going to illustrate today with the development of just the same, used as a concessive meaning nevertheless, as in an example that I constructed, where parents objected but just the same, they got married. Although her parents objected, they got married. She and her uh, boyfriend got married. Just the same there means although or nevertheless. And I'll talk about how that came into being and how we might think of representing the changes. What do I mean by discourse structuring marker? I mean a connective, syntactically a conjunct that cues speaker's view of the relationship between discourse segment one and discourse segment two. For example, but, if you hear but, you know that the content of the upcoming clause in some way contrasts with that of the preceding one. Uh, Fraser and Many other people call these discourse markers. And uh, my data are all drawn from standard electronic corpora for English. Uh, you may uh, be familiar with some of these, maybe not all of them. There's the corpus of late modern English texts from 1710 to 1920. It's about 34 million words. And most of the texts are literary. There are also quite a lot of treatises. Uh, Coca, you may be familiar with, Corpus of Contemporary American English from 1990 to 2019. That is now over a billion words, a very large corpus. Uh, we'll also use Coha, the Corpus of Historical American English, from 1820 to 2019, and I'm using the 2021 20, release, which is about 475 million words. And also what's called EEBO, Early English Books Online, from 1473 to 1700, that's about 765 million words. And they're printed words. So if you use that corpus, you need to be careful about the dates. The dates are the dates of the printed books, not of composition or manuscript. Um, I'll move this a little bit so that I, I can. Uh, okay. Here's my definitions. Subjectification, in my current view, is increase in the degree to which speakers base meanings in and orient them toward their own perspective. Intersubjectification is increase in the degree to which speakers pay attention to addressees and orient meanings toward addressees, cognitive stances, and social identities. And textualization is increase in the degree to which speakers pay overt attention to text creation and invite addressees to interpret textual relationships. Increase is crucial here. I'm concerned with evidence for strengthening of the degree of orientation to self, other, and text. And importantly, I no longer define intersubjectification in terms of subjectification. Agreeing with Lisa Lotte Brems, 2021, that they should be kept distinct. And that's a picture of Brems. <clears throat> 
much used example of subjectification is the development I'll be going to from a motion with a purpose expression to one of futurity. I'll come back to that. An example of intersubjectification is the verb please give pleasure, coming to be used in the formula if you please, if it gives you pleasure, and eventually as a polite request marker. And that is a focus on the addressee. And an example of textualization is use of by the way, which used to mean along the road, by the wayside, to indicate that the upcoming clause is an aside or a digression. Now, moving on to Langacker, my headings are not appearing, but anyway, uh, moving on to Langacker, and that's a picture of him. Uh, as I think is very well known, that he has a rather different view of subjectification from myself. Although he has said in print somewhere around 2006 that they're just variants of each other. And as I said before, I'm going to focus on the difference between his position and mine, uh, because I suspect you're very familiar with Langacker's work. And uh, I think it's important to keep his work and mine separate. Back in 1990 and 1991, Langacker wrote a couple of articles where he made it very clear, and he's repeated since then, that subjectification is construal, a semantic shift or extension in which an entity originally construed objectively comes to receive a more subjective construal. That's a quotation from Langacker 1991. The, he makes a distinction between on-stage profiled and objective elements and unprofiled subjective elements. Oh, now I can get rid of it. Okay. Try, trying to get to the top of this. All right. Okay. Uh, so he distinguishes an on-stage profiled and objective element and an off-stage unprofiled and subjective element. He began to think of subjectification as a kind of bleaching or fading away of an objectively construed element. For example, in a 2006 paper, he cites 5, 5A. He was going to mail the letter, which is ambiguous. It's either motioned by an agent, he, or that agent's future intention. He was going to mail the letter as he was en route, walking uh, or driving uh, to the post office to mail his letter. Or he was simply planning on mailing the letter. And there, there's an on-stage agent who's profiled, he. But in 5B, it's going to rain There's no on-stage profiled agent. There's the future projection by an off-stage conceptualizer, in this case, the speaker. Langacker's idea is that speaker's always there and off-stage. In fact, the speaker is off-stage in both those examples. He was going to mail the letter. There's a speaker who conceptualizes or construes motion by the agent from one place to another, or construes an agent's intention. There's no I in there. There's no I in it's going to rain. Speaker is offstage, covert, hiding. In 5A, he was going to mail the letter. 
speaker conceptualizes a profiled, objectively construed perceiver he as an agent in motion or as an agent who intended to do something in the future. In 5b, it's going to rain, motion and agent are bleached, leaving the speaker as the conceptualizer. Now, you probably noticed that a lot of his terminology suggests change, at least it evokes change, originally construed. The originally uh, could be understood as earlier in history. Uh, I'm not entirely clear why he thinks it's original, but uh, literally construed, Yes, it's, and he talks about subjectification. Asian to me is to me means change, and he refers to bleaching. Nevertheless, his work is primarily synchronic. His analysis teases apart the mental extrapolation involved when conceptualizing either the motion or the future interpretations. He's not concerned with the dynamics of change. He has not until recently been concerned with the interactive stances that speakers take in negotiating meaning. However, in a paper in 2012, he outlines what he calls a unified account of language in which each interlocutor is aware of the other. He says both the I and the you are typically off stage and implicit. There's another quote from him. This is 2012. To some extent, each, the I and the you, engages in a simulation of the other's experience, thereby apprehending the situation from the other's vantage point within it, as well as from her own. This is intersubjectivity. This is the I and the you, the speaker and the addressee, uh, negotiating meaning. Note it is symmetric. The addressee simulates the speaker. Uh, I should just note that Langacker does not address intersubjectification or textualization. I totally agree that interlocutors are typically implicit and aware of each other. Intersubjectivity is always in play because speaker speaks <clears throat> and tries to coordinate cognitively with the addressee. <clears throat> this is a point that's been made by many people, uh, most particularly at length by Verhagen in 2005. Uh, earlier, Bonvenist in 1958 uh, made the distinction between subjectivity and intersubjectivity that I think has been the basis of almost everybody's work uh, in Europe and the US. Uh, Lyons, 1982, also talked about it. And I understand several Japanese linguists in the 1950s, but unfortunately, I don't read Japanese. And so I'm not familiar with their work. The, the point is that in the 1950s, a lot of people were thinking about subjectivity and intersubjectivity and trying to define them. So although I agree that interlocutors are typically implicit and aware of each other, and that intersubjectivity is always in play, Speakers and addresses are not symmetric. One produces, the other interprets. Interpretation may not match what the speaker produces, and this is the fundamental reason why change occurs. We would like to think we always understand each other, but unfortunately we don't. Now, unfortunately, this, what I have up here is, is covered up. No, no, there's. As a historical linguist, 
I can only speculate about mental processes in the past, including construals. This is a point that Hilpert makes in his 2018 article that's much cited about three problems for cognitive linguistics. So I have different questions from Langakers. They have to do with changes that we can observe in texts, not with construals, not with minds, which we cannot observe in texts. When I started my work on subjectification and intersubjectification, that you call is was in the 1980s, I was also working on grammaticalization and thinking about unidirectionality. I'm now working in a constructionist framework where unidirectionality is not a major concern. And this has led me to rethink the relationship between subjectification, intersubjectification, and textualization. Now what? So let me talk about construction grammar. And I'm going to talk about construction grammar of the Goldberg variety. There she is in front of the gate in Berlin. There are several varieties of construction grammar, as I'm sure you know. They're discussed in Hoffman and Trousdale's handbook on construction grammar. I draw on her models because they've been widely used in diachronic construction grammar, and I found that they are helpful in thinking about change. Constructions are pairings of form and function. They used earlier to be called form and meaning, but function is a broader term, which uh, Goldberg and many others have now adopted. The pair, the form function pairing, functions as a unit, as a sign with a symbolic link between form and function. And a formalism such as I have here, uh, brackets outside, internally form linked to function, was suggested in Boy 2010, where the arrow stands for the symbolic link. Now, there are a couple of differences from Saussure's science, although there's also some similarity. One difference is that constructions can be whole clauses, idioms, phrases, or single words. For him, they were single words. Another difference is that they may be either segmental, substantive, like dog, or abstract, very schematic. For example, NP sub X, V sub T, MP sub Y, linked to entity sub X affects entity sub Y, is a transitive construction. That is a very abstract schematic construction. And another respect in which signs are different from Saussure's signs, the signs in construction grammar are different from Saussure's signs, is that although they are units, constructions consist of a complex set of components. Uh, Belcroft, whose picture is there, uh, usefully pointed out that form has at least three properties, syntactic, morphological, and phonological. And meaning or function has at least three properties as well. Semantic, pragmatic, and discourse function. For example, given new. And each one of these process, properties may change over time. So construction is a 
form function unit that has a lot of complex internal structure. In the book I mentioned, I proposed adding a communicative function, CF, to account for various classes of constructions, including discourse structuring markers, interjections, and a variety of attitudinal expressions. Uh, this is something that uh, Bert Hargan drew attention to in the 2005 book. These cue the addressee how to interpret the function of associated units at a notably intersubjective, even if they can be subsumed in Croft's model under Prag, they are special in this sense. They are pragmatic, yes, but they are intersubjectively pragmatic. And the key point is that they're intersubjective. Work on the historical development of constructions began with Israel in the paper that came out in 1996 on the development of the way construction. This is something that Goldberg had discussed in her 1995 book. For example, elbow one's way through the crowd. And what is now called diachronic construction grammar emerged in several books from 2008 on. For example, Bergs and Develop 2008. I think that was actually um, the book that kick started the field. Uh, Helper 2013, Barthal et al. 2015. And in a book with Graham Trousdale, who's there, uh, we, among others, propose that constructions come into being by a process of constructionalization. That term is obviously on analogy with grammaticalization. It refers to the coming into being of constructions. We currently characterize this as the establishment of a new symbolic link between form and function, which has been replicated across the network of language users and which involves an addition to the constructicon. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Let me get rid of this again. Okay. On two past here. I was trying to make the top of this clear. Uh, that definition of constructionization, the word establishment, what does that mean? It means in our understanding that at least two speakers uh, share this new form function unit. It's also called conventionalization. And this knowledge is stored in a constructicon. What is a constructicon? Goldberg in 2003 suggested that the totality of our knowledge of language is captured by a network of constructions, a constructicon. So Goldberg thinks of a network highlighting highlighting interconnectedness and links between constructions within it. Uh, Constructicon has also been referred to as an inventory by people like Linkfeld. And this definition highlights lists as in a lexicon, but with details of constructional properties. Uh, I am... Uh, using constructing and con in Goldberg's sense, because I think it's important to think of our knowledge of language as our knowledge of 
related constructions, constructions and how they are networked and related to each other. Constructionization is a gradual development, gradual across language users who come to share a new form function pairing and gradual across texts. It is preceded and followed by shifts in contextual use. These shifts do not involve additions to the constructicon. In my book with Graham Charlesdale in 2013, they're called Constructional Changes. I prefer to call them Constructional Shifts because they really are shifts, not changes in our definition, which involves establishment of a new relationship. Such shifts are often changes in the frequency with which certain constructions are used together or assembled. This is a very important point that Petre made in 2019, and that's a picture of Petre. So the idea here is that the way in which people use constructions together or assemble constructions is very important in change. I'll come back to that with the, our case study. So now to my question that I posed at the beginning. Is it possible to make a coherent generalization of, of ordering between subjectification, intersubjectification, and textualization? In my early work, which focused on epistemics, like in fact, indeed, and actually, I noticed that in many cases, a meaning based in a speaker's perspective precedes meaning that pays attention to the addressee. At the time, I thought that meanings were first subjectified, then possibly subtextualized, and eventually intersubjectified. And they said, if there occurs a meaning shift, which in the process of grammaticalization entails shifts from one functional semantic component to another, then such a shift is more likely to be from propositional through textual to expressive than in the reverse direction. That's what I said in 1982. Note a couple of important things here. The if, if there occurs a meaning shift, and more likely, such a shift is more likely to be from propositional through textual. So the hypothesized change, as I presented it, as I thought about it, is a tendency. It is not a determinative, determinative uh, type of change, although many people have tried to understand it that way. And it was meant to, to be generalizable. And the other thing to note about that quotation is that the characterization is linked to grammaticalization, which at the time was widely understood as a unidirectional change from lexical to grammatical meaning or function. According to the hypothesis, that I have just read out nine, uh, there would be a unidirectional shift across linguistic components. The model that I presented in one, propositional, optionally to textual, to expressive. The terms in the functional semantic models of language envisaged in nine and 10 were adopted from Halliday and Hassan's 1976 metafunctions, ideational, interpersonal, and textual. Those are the other terms. 
These are clusters of semantic properties that signal aspects of clausal networks. Halliday and Hassan conceptualized them as separate, independent synchronic functions. And I used their terms and my terms. So the equivalents are basically as follows. Halliday and Hassan's ideational was my propositional. Their textual stayed the same, my textual and their interpersonal I called expressive. Their interpersonal and my expressive subsumed subjectivity and intersubjectivity. That was 1982. But in the 20 years following that, I learned something. <laughs> and uh, based on studies of primarily modal expressions in the histories of English and Japanese, uh, in a book I uh, wrote with Richard Dasher in 2002 on regularity and semantic change, we proposed a different trajectory, non-subjective to subjective to intersubjective. Here, subjective and intersubjective are split, and I think pretty much everybody would agree they should be split. Uh, you will notice that textual plays no role in 12, and a lot of people were unhappy about that, but it happened that textual wasn't important for that book, so we didn't talk about it. Uh, like my earlier proposal, propositional to textual to expressive, this was conceptualized as a generalizable client and was influenced by thinking in terms of grammaticalization where directionality was and still is very important. Now I think it was a mistake to posit a client. There are two problems. One is that strict unidirectionality in the sense that it is irreversible as Hasbro Math 1999 and various other people have said, that view of Strict unidirectionality, unidirectionality is a hypothesis that died of its science back in 2001 with uh, a collection of papers that Campbell edited in Language Sciences and nor is 2009 on degrammaticalization. Uh, everybody I think would agree that in general, there are shifts from lexical to grammatical, but there are also counter examples. So, uh, the idea that subjectification and intersubjectification are in some irreversible unidirectional cline just doesn't stand up anymore because the notion of irreversible unidirectionality, uh, as I said, has died of its science. People researched it and people found that it, the hypothesis simply doesn't hold up all the time. It holds up some of the time and maybe mostly <laughs> it holds up, but not uh, as robustly as people originally thought. The second problem is that a Klein implicates a continuum and conceptual connectedness between the domains within it. Subjectivity and intersubjectivity, subjectification and intersubjectification have to do with interpersonal interlocutor perspectives and relationships. By contrast, textual connective functions have to do with relationships between parts of discourse and are partially syntactic. Speak speakers are not syntactic, uh, texts are. Uh, it is, of course, the speaker who decides, usually unconsciously, 
what discourse relationship to present, and it is addressee who interprets that relationship. Speakers and addressee orientation are intertwined in language use with text orientation. But functionally, speakers and addressees are different from textual orientations. They're not functionally similar enough, in my view, to warrant being linearized on a continuum. But people try to put them on a continuum. And I'll just mention a few hypotheses. Uh, my original hypotheses uh, and variants of it have rightly been challenged on grounds of definition and types of evidence. That's what should happen with any hypothesis. It should be a testable hypothesis and it should be challenged. Heine et al. in 1991, and that's a picture of Bernd Heine, cited the development of interrogative pronouns such as which and who into relative divisors and suggested a revision of 10, the proposition to textual to expressive kind, as 13. Ideational function to interpersonal function to textual function. So text now is the last of the three, not the second. There have been other challenges, including potential examples, counterexamples to the hypothesis that intersubjectification is necessarily preceded by subjectification. Uh, I list various people, Brabham, Gesker, Naro, Burton, and Brems, all of whom uh, have raised potential counterexamples. That's how research functions. We put out a hypothesis and someone counter, counters it, and that is how we progress in our thinking. But each one of those authors whom I've just mentioned expresses at least some interest in maintaining the idea of ordering the changes. Gesquier proposed that intersubjective uses can precede subjective uses, as in the development of determiners and predeterminers like main in the main problem and such in such a problem. So for her, you have intersubjective, subjective, and textual or textual intersubjective, subjective. The point is that intersubjective precedes subjective. That's a picture of his gear. Uh, both main and such that I just cited have both intersubjective and textual functions by which the speaker negotiates discourse to referent tracking for the hearer. That's what she said in a book in 2010. Mm -hmm. This is a different type of textual meaning from the one that I'm talking about. It's reference tracking rather than creation of connective discourse. And Halliday and Hassan 1976 is a good place to start if you're wondering about thinking of types of textual function. They distinguish these two that I've just uh, mentioned. Reference tracking, that is what Fillmore and Brayvon have called discourse delixis, uh, where you have pronouns like this and that. The, the Halliday and Hassan distinguish reference tracking like this and that from creation of connective discourse by markers such as and, after all, by the way, and the one we'll look at just the same. Uh, that means that Gesquier's analysis is not a direct counterexample to mine, but it does raise uh, important questions again, about what is the relationship among these three, if indeed there is a, some kind of historical sequence, or maybe there isn't. Uh, 
Taking a speech act perspective, NARO in 2014 proposes that the relevant concepts are speaker orientation, text orientation, hearer orientation. And he concludes that ordering of developments may vary in different domains of grammar. You may have noticed that I mentioned in my uh, earlier work that I was dealing with uh, markers like, in fact, uh, which are epistemic. But if you look at modals, as modal verbs rather than modal adverbs, uh, you may find that there's a rather different development. So although modals are a domain of grammar, they have some domains uh, which are syntactic. So there's a syntactic and verbial domain like clearly or truly, or in fact, and a auxiliary verb domain where you have auxiliary verbs like will and shall and can. So there may be different ordering of developments in different domains of grammar or subdomains of grammar. He further suggests that all three orientations may be subsumable within a broad tendency of change that might be labeled increased speech act orientation. And in that case, you wouldn't actually have a sequence. You would simply have different kind of orientation. Nevertheless, despite saying that you could really subsume everything under one kind of orientation, a speech act orientation, he is interested in that article in 2014 in a sequence of changes. Now, there are so many proposals about ordering that I think one could see that the idea is problematic. At the very least, it suggests that ordering is domain specific or even item specific and not generalizing. Well, so I conclude that attempts to order the three change types on a client are mistaken. Subjectification and intersubjectification are, in my view, conceptually closely connected, but distinct. They result from dyadic communicative negotiation of meaning. They are intertwined with textualization, understood as creating connectively coherent linguistic text, but are conceptually somewhat distant from it. Textualization is a task the dyadic pair engages in when negotiating meaning and discourse. It is not on a direct continuum with intersubjectification. Time is going fast and I apologize. We got mixed up at the beginning with how to use this PowerPoint. Uh, so I'll probably run a little bit past six, but um, let's, briefly discuss uh, some data because everything I've been saying is very abstract. I'd like to consider the history of just the same. Just the same, like many discourse markers, uh, can be used in a literal sense, which is exactly the same, as in I did it in just the same way as you did it or it can be used as a coordinate concessive marker, a conjunct meaning nevertheless. And in that respect, it's very similar to all the same. Uh, and they liked it all the same. Doesn't mean they like it in exactly the same way, though it could, but normally they liked it all the same would mean uh, they liked it nevertheless. There were some problems with it, but they liked it nevertheless. I think when you uh, read about concessives, you usually read about although. Although is a subordinator, but just the same at all the same, nevertheless, and some other concessives are 
coordinators. Uh, I think you can define and think about coordinators in the same way as you can think about all the concessives. Uh, Eckhart Koenig back in 1986 proposed that concessives involve assertions, a P and a Q, or if you like a D1 and a D2. P and Q is better because they're not always in the order D1 and D2, as we'll see. Uh, so the two assertions and an evoked background assumption, if P normally not Q. Remember the example in two it was constructed, her parents subjected, but just the same, they got married. The assertions are her parents subjected and they got married. And then just the same marks overtly, overtly and evokes a background assumption. If her parents objected, then normally they would not have got married. An evoked background assumption may be relatively objective, depending on societal norms, or subjective, depending on speaker's viewpoint. In using a concessive marker, speaker invites adversity to compute the background assumption. That's an intersubjective function. Some examples uh, from Coca of concessive use of just the same. He'd made the landing without incident, but just the same, he had no intention of pushing his luck. That can't mean literally just the same, just the same as what? Uh, it means nevertheless. It evokes the assumption normally if one lands without incident, one will not hesitate to try again. He didn't expect to be in court until late in the following week, but he'd come in early just the same. This evokes the assumption that normally a lawyer does not arrive that early, a week early, for a court case. You can paraphrase the examples in 16 with although. Although he made a landing without incident, he had no intention of pushing his luck. Both of those examples have but, but you don't have to have but, it's optional. And just the same may proceed the D2, just the same he had no intention. Or if follow it, he'd come in early, just the same. By contrast, although can only proceed. Now, historically, we find just the same, meaning exactly the same, attested in the 1620s in early English books online. They fastened the plate so neatly to the lock that it was just the same as it was before. So it was exactly similar to what it was before. And notice the ads, there is a comparison, just the same as it was before. Nor doth any word when applied to God signify just the same as when applied to men, but only somewhat analogous thereto. Just and same are speaker oriented insofar as they express speaker's degree of certainty, just about the degree of similarity, which is the same between two entities. Security of the lock before and after, use of terms such as person for God. They also cue the addressee to assess the accuracy of the statement. So they are, when they are literal in their original sense, they are somewhat subjective. And pragmatically, they're somewhat intersubjective. They are pragmatically subjective because they express speaker's degree of certainty. They are intersubjective in that they cue the addressee to the accuracy of the statement. And as Tina Brebaum said in that scripture of her, 
Saying two things are the same always implies non-identity of reference in order to assert the identity of the referent. You will never say two things are the same unless they are different to start with, and then you can assess whether they're similar or not. So literal same implicates alternatives, as does just. So just the same as a literal expression is very pragmatic. Uh, and you find it used through the centuries until the late, late 19th century, 1870s plus. And you begin to find examples like 18. I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nests. This was mere exclamation, the froth of the storm. He adored Bathsheba just the same. So here he is venting about something that she's done and he's angry, but nevertheless, he adored her. The just the same said, nevertheless, he adored her. Although he vented, nevertheless, he adored her. 18b, all right, perhaps I lie. Just the same, I'll not do any such errand even for you. That's certain. Here yeah, you have that just the same before. Uh, the assertion, I'll not do anything. It means perhaps I lie. Nevertheless, although I lie, I'll not do anything. There's no accessible antecedent here. Nothing to be the same as. It's used with a textual function as a concessive, meaning nevertheless. It evokes alternatives, an implied norm, and an expressed state of affairs counter to the implied norm. So what were originally implicatures of difference and alternatives associated with literal just and literal same have come to be the main function of the concessive expression. Compared to literal use in 17, concessive use in 18 is more text oriented, just the same as used to signal. The speaker grants acknowledges a state of affairs, perhaps I lie, in P, then rejects a background assumption evoked. Because I admit the lie, I'll do the errand. It is more speaker oriented because it serves to mark speaker's evaluation of the relationship between P and Q as not fully compatible. And it is more addressee oriented it cues the addressee to access the evoked assumption and accept the veracity of the statement. I'll not do any such error, contrary to the evoked assumption. So in just the same, we find an example of a combination of just and the same in which each member is originally low in subjectivity, intersubjectivity and textuality, that's stage one, being used as a unit not separate lexical elements, but used as an idiom, if you like, as a concessive in a way that is more subjective, more intersubjective, and more textual than the individual parts at stage one. You have what uh, I call a DSM, a discourse structuring marker, a conjunct link to a contrastive function. Now, I mentioned earlier that Petre talked about assemblies. What were the assemblies that led to this development? What were the various uses, contextual uses? Increased use without a referentially accessible non more to be the same as. Use in negative contexts, not X, but Y. Use in the context of but, it very often occurs in that context, still does and in discourse about possible alternative states of affairs. It's probably also analogy with clause final contrastus, like after all and however, which already existed and with all the same that already existed from the early 19th century on. 
Now, in a construction grammar model, a construction that is newly constructionalized automatically gets or inherits three features from the pre-existing schema. In this case, the discourse structure of marking contrastive schema. It's one that is very old, has a very, very old history. And the three features that every discourse structuring marker has is a textual. The purpose of a discourse structuring marker is to index the connective relationship between D1 and D2. It is subjective. The speaker chooses, usually unconsciously, to connect the two clauses in a certain way. And it is intersubjective. It's a procedural cue to address the about how to interpret the relationship between one, D1 and D2. How can we model all this? Uh, using Croft's model, we can model it this way. I mentioned earlier that Croft suggested that a construction that is a unit and the unit. Ooh. Sorry. Okay, there we are. The construction is a unit that is shown by this outside box. It has internal components. This has four. And the one that's relevant in this case is that it's syntactically a conjunct. Symbolically linked to pragmatic component. The pragmatics of this are is connected, a connective, a discourse function. It's a discourse structuring marker of a concessive type and textual. This is weakly subjective, weakly intersubjective. Uh, so you've got textual, weakly subjective, and weakly intersubjective. So those properties, textual, subjective, intersubjective, are separate and of equal status. That's exactly like Halliday and Hassan's 1976 three metafaction functions, they are separate. My 1989 three tendencies, which are separate, but overlapping. And NAROG's 2014 equal orientations, three equal orientations. They're not in succession, they are simultaneous. They occur at the same time, they exist at the same time in our knowledge of the language, in our constructicon. Treating textual along with subjective and intersubjective as a subtype of communicative function addresses Gisgier's concern that much textual marking is both subjective and intersubjective. And I have proposed that no ordering of the concepts on the continuum is needed. If an expression is already weakly textual, subjective and intersubjective, the result of constructionalization as a DSM will be a new construction that is more textual, subjective, and intersubjective than its source. The lexical combination just and same was already weakly textual because it's an aroporic same as, it was subjective and intersubjective as I showed. When it came to be used as a DSM, it became to be incrementally textual, subjective and intersubjective, more of each of those. So just the same as a procedural, a marker that guides interpretation involving weak subjectification, intersubjectification, both at the same time. And depending on the function of the procedural, the development may involve textualization as well. That's NAROG's point that there's probable domain specific specificity for textual orientation. Yeah. 
So I have argued that subjectification and intersubjectification are diachronic concepts and identifiable in constructional expressions. <coughs> the subjectivity and intersubjectivity in which they result concern interlocutors in the speech writing dyad. Textualization also is a diachronic concept. In the relatively narrow sense adopted here, it results in overt marking of connective coherence relationships in the flow of speech, writing, and signing. I have suggested, and I strongly now believe, that attempts to include textual in an intersubjectivity client confuse separate tasks in which speakers engage. It, they confuse indication of discourse coherence relations and orientation toward the self and the other in the interactive diet. I have suggested that a constructional approach provides a way of modeling the separate functions. And note that as, a, <laughs> excuse me, as the properties textual, weakly subjective and weakly intersubjective are independent, each may in principle shift or not at any time in any order. But when a discourse structuring marker comes into being, they're all drawn on at the same time. And I suspect they are mostly drawn on at the same time. So although I've been running late, I'd like to just suggest a couple of uh, lines of further research in case you're interested. Most obvious one is testing how useful these ideas are for analysis of languages other than English. For example, how useful are they for Chinese? Testing whether subjectification into subjectification and textualization occur simultaneously in the development of other domains, such as epistemic modal markers, like in fact, when it's used to mark topic shift and reference tracking such markers, such like such. Uh, my first definition of textualization uh, suggested that textualization is greater or more or less feature. But textualization may involve getting to be more textual. I am not certain that that is a absolutely accurate. Is connectivity more or less textual than reference tracking by our pronouns or determiners, for example? Anyway, whether textualization is gradient is, I think, something uh, worth investigating. And I also think it's worth investigating the role of turn-taking <clears throat> in the changes discussed here from a construction perspective. <clears throat> There's been some very interesting work on communicative tasks in turn-taking by, for example, Hazelow, but they haven't been done in terms of diachronic construction grammar. So with those thoughts about things that you might do as follow-ups, uh, I invite uh, your questions, your comments, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Professor Trogart, for your wonderful talk. Uh, so now let's come to the Q&A session. So yeah. from the audience, if you have any question, you can unmute yourself and talk to Professor Trogart directly. <laughs> or yes, I, to say, I think questions are absolutely crucial uh, mm -hmm. for promoting research. Uh, without asking questions and challenging, uh, we can't move forward. So I welcome any kinds of questions. Um, so here's one. Are subjectification into subjectification and textualization the result of motivation or mechanism, mechanism of the evolution of a discourse thing? Uh, no. Uh, not the way I've been thinking, nor the way I presented it. Those are, my point was that if you become a discourse marker, 
if a unit becomes a discourse marker, it will, at the same time, come to be more subjective and intersubjective, and it will also come to be textual. Uh, if you think about just the same in its literal sense, as I mentioned, there is some subjectivity and some intersubjectivity, but that's not subjectification. It's not a change. It's not a shift in the amount, the degree, the extent of the subjectivity or the intersubjectivity or the textuality. <clears throat> <coughs> so I would say uh, they're not the result of the evolution. Are they the motivation? That is a more interesting question. Uh, and I've always had problems with the idea that subjectification is a motivation. Why would people want something to be more subjective? There are modes of speaking, some of which are more subjective than others. The, for example, uh, speech is notoriously more subjective than uh, most writing. I say most writing because some writing, uh, particularly fiction, which represents or says, claims to represent speech, uh, is clearly more subjective than writing a thesis about constructionalization. Uh, a mechanism, well, uh, It's, they're not mechanisms either. I, I know that in the past I've said that subjectification is a mechanism, but it's not a how of change. It's a what of change, what, what is the result of a change in my current view? I, if that answer is not clear, uh, please ask another one. Okay, here's another question. How to make the study of semantic change deeply in the future? Well, one can always deepen any kind of study by looking at more examples, by asking different questions, by taking different models. Uh, I hope that by uh, taking a constructional point of view, I have somewhat expanded the view of how semantic pragmatic change works. Uh, I suggested some things that one could do in the future, and I'll go back to those. I can. The first one is crucial to me. If you want to deepen studies of semantic and pragmatic or pragmatic change, you have to look at other languages and you have to look at the historical data in other languages and you have to look at it as the best evidence that we have of speakers knowledge of a language at an earlier time it's always a best guess uh, you asked about semantic change uh, i think in cognitive linguistics for the most part one doesn't make too much of a difference between semantics and pragmatics, but I've always made a little bit and Croft made a little bit because uh, the semantics can be the referential meaning, the pragmatics is more uh, the interpretation 
beyond the literal meaning. That's an old distinction, but, and, and they are on a continuum. So I think we're talking about uh, semantic pragmatic change when we discuss uh, things in the future. Um, there's a question about Heine, and then another one about measure of the strength. Okay. What do I think of interactions put forward by Heine? Do you, I think? Well, it does. He did actually include, I'm having difficulty getting back, but if you look at his example, his example did include something very textual, there he is. Uh, this, this is his Klein, or their Klein, Heine, Claudia, and Hünemeyer in 1990. You'll find item 13 here, ideational to interpersonal to textual. And what's his example? His, their example is who and which. If you start out with an interrogative pronoun, and that's his original literal meaning, and you then use it as a relativizer, you have used it in a textual way. So Heine definitely, I've lost the, the question here, but um, Heine definitely did include textual function. I don't think he's particularly interested in these kinds of, of changes. He's more interested in metaphorical changes. But yes, he will include textual and he's actually suggested this. This is, this is his own claim. Moving on to the index. How do we index? measure the strength of subjectivity? This is a difficult question. This is a question about operationalizing subjectification and intersubjectification. There's a whole volume on trying to operationalize intersubjectification. It's the one in which Narog's paper appears. I have one too. And uh, I don't think there's been any great success in providing an excellent answer or a convincing answer to your question about how do we measure the strength of subjectivity and intersubjectivity, except by looking at context. I mean, if you just look at how a word changes, if I just give you uh, just the same, literal, just the same, comes to mean just the same concessive. Well, there's nothing, no context there. If you just take who and say it was an interrogative pronoun, which it was, and it became a relativizer, which it did, uh, there's nothing there to tell you about what kinds of assemblies and contexts or anything in which it occurred. But uh, when you look closely at context, then I think you begin to get a sense of subjectivity and intersubjectivity. Does the context talk about me, the writer, me, the speaker, uh, or about the, or does it address the NRC, you? the reader, you, uh, the person in front of me. Now, uh, as Langacker says, and I agree, the I and the you are often off stage. So you may not find these, but that's a place to look uh, for strength of subjectivity and intersubjectivity. Uh, I think when you find something that really is not used at all, 
for expressing the individual person's uh, point of view, uh, like please, uh, that's a sign of very strong interceptification of the expression, if you please. If you please meant if it is pleasing to you. That's a conditional, yes, it's subjective, is it con because it's a conditional. Uh, it is intersubjective because it is addressing the adversary, pleasing to you. But it's totally referential. Somebody could say, yes, that's pleasing to me, or it's not pleasing to me. Or it pleases me, it doesn't please me. But when I when a speaker starts to use it as please, then it becomes primarily in the subjective. It is somewhat subjective. I mean, it's the speaker decides to be polite and decides to request something, of course. But the main purpose of please and the main meaning of please is addressee, I would like you respectfully to do something. Wow. So that's one way of measuring. It's not a very satisfactory answer. I'm aware of that. Um, but that would be to add to that, to the answer uh, to the question, how do we strengthen work on, how do we go deeper in work on semantic pragmatic change? So yes, add that. How do we operationalize? What are essentially very clever kinds of meaning. I mean, meaning is uh, not out there on the table. <laughs> it is negotiated. It is always potential. OK, someone asks whether I could explain again how they influence word order. Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. They don't, in my view, influence word order. Uh, except to the extent that from a perspective of uh, interlocutors, if I'm speaking, I may want to start out in the flow of speech by drawing your attention. Hello. Oh. And I may want, when I finished, not just to drop my voice uh, to give you a chance to say something, but I may use a marker uh, to indicate that it's your turn. So when you look at changes in word order that have to do with these discourse markers that I've been working on for so long, I think you can say that it's not the word order that's influenced, but where you put a particular marker may influence the interpretation. Now, uh, perhaps you are thinking of the claim that was made by uh, Beeching et al. that normally subjective is only uh, at the beginning and intersubjective is on at the end. They call this left periphery and right periphery which is unfortunate because I, well, I've used the term, and, uh, but it's actually rather unfortunate because it assumes a left-right writing system. Uh, in speech, you can say it's at the beginning and it's at the end. It's initial or it's final. Uh, so 
So I would say that Beeching et al.'s hypothesis is not deterministic. It's been shown by myself and others uh, to be a good tendency. Subjective things do tend to occur at the beginning in English and French and maybe the European languages in general and intersubjective ones at the end, but not necessarily. I mean, just think about please. You can say, please think about this or think about this, please. Right? Those are options. They don't mean quite the same thing because the please at the end has more to do with uh, passing the turn on to the next person, yielding the floor. Uh, there's also medial position, which Lenker in a 2014 article talked about, where you put something in the middle. Uh, they will just the same get married. They just the same will get married. So it's not at the beginning, it's not at the end. She suggests that anything that's put after the first constituent, which is the subject, and this is in English, after the first constituent, the subject, or an adjunct in the morning, they may do something. Um, anything that's after the first constituent is going to focus retroactively to the beginning or to what proceeds. It's going to put attention onto what proceeds. Whereas if it's the middle after a finite verb, it will focus attention on the end. So how does this relate? I don't think that subjectification, intersubjectification influence word order, but they are very much intertwined with word order. Uh, you can't say anything or write anything without some kind of ordering. And how you order things is going to uh, play out with uh, subjectification and intersubjectification. Word order really is a textual matter, so it, it relates more to textualization than the other two. I seem to be missing out on some other chats here, so let's see. Um, oh, I can answer that question. <laughs> Just the same and all the same can be both initial and final. Just the same is preferred in the corpora I've looked at, uh, in final position, all the same is about half, half initial, final. And both of them can be clause medial. Okay, how do I define clause medial? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Linker in a 2014 article, uh, discusses medial at significant length. She's picking up on Greenbaum, who wrote a book in 1969, I think. Uh, she posits five positions. Now, obviously, you have to have a very complex sentence. I have five positions. But she has one that's post-subject, one that is post I don't like in the morning. In the morning, by the way, I saw a heron. Right? Uh, it's after, one after the subject, which is the, if the subject is the first element. I, by the way, saw a heron, a heron, a bird. <laughs> um, just making that up. You can put it after the finite verb. And she says, uh, this is Greenbaum and Link, Link are both. 
they can occur after the auxiliary verb. I will, by the way, uh, finish up soon. Or I, it can be after the verb. Uh, I will, I find this one very odd, but uh, she has found it. Uh, if you have an auxiliary, it's usually after the auxiliary, but you can have an auxiliary and a verb. I will in the morning do it. Uh, or I will I will do in the morning it. No, I don't like that one. <laughs> there is a post non-finite verb position. And there are plenty of adjunct slots. Trying to make up a, a good example. Um, I will do it in the evening, by the way, tomorrow. In the evening is one adjunct, it's a temporal. Tomorrow is another temporal, and you can put something in there. So that's how I define, or, or how she defines uh, clause medium. Uh, let's see what we got. Can we distinguish subjectivity from a sentence type or a sentence pattern? I don't think we can distinguish subjectivity. I think um, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. If the question means, is there a sentence type which will show us that something is subjective? Uh, yes, there are. There are explanatory, exclamatory sentences. There are sentences with discourse markers. Uh, those will uh, indicate a sentence pattern that is subjective. But I don't think that's what the question meant. Uh, can we distinguish subjectivity from a sentence type? So I understand that to mean is subjectivity separate from sentence type or sentence pattern? And no, I don't think so. Uh, some patterns are more subjective than others. The exclamatory ones in English, uh, most of those are idioms, like uh, that one we had with Bathsheba, uh, where actually the word order is sometimes uh, different. Uh, <clears throat> Since I'm not entirely sure that I understand it, uh, that's my best approach at the moment. Uh, Hi, Professor Long. Yes, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof uh, Professor Trogard. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, hi, Ping Long. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Yeah, sorry to be, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk, and uh, maybe my question is a little bit long, but uh, yeah, yeah, I can, can, let me see if I can finish it short. So, uh, actually, I was, uh, you know, I was reading your book, uh, 2020, 2022, uh, Discourse, Discourse Structure Markers, and uh, uh, I was looking at some, some Discourse Markers that are really interesting. Uh, let me, let me, let me name, name some of them. Num number one is back to X point. Number two is probably that was in your uh, in your paper in 1989. And uh, then after all, then actually, you see, uh, back to X point. Actually, I um, I mean for the whole changes, I just see textual function, and uh, for probably 
uh, for the whole changes. I just see just subjectification. Uh, anyway, anyway, it is just a yeah, subjectification. For after all, uh, first, I mean, in your descriptions, first it was kind of textual function. Then it is it was epistemic function, uh, if I understand it correctly. And when I was seeing, uh, looking at uh, actually, basically at first it was epistemic function, and then it developed into some form, a kind of, of a kind of textual function. Yeah. So I mean, these four particles, or these four discourse markers, actually it seems their developments are different. So I would agree with uh, uh, Laroga and the other people to say that uh, <clears throat> sometimes we need to. Uh, to separate to, 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 to separate the different domains. At least, I mean, well, back to X point, it seems it is just a textual point, a textual function involved. Right. Well, probably I would say it is just epistemic or subject, subjective function involved. So, but still, you, if you see after all, and actually, actually, it seems that developments are a little bit different. After all, I mean, uh, you would describe it as epistemic function, but it is later stage. Right. So uh, for all these involved, first, uh, I mean, these guys, I was also looking at it uh, and looking at this host markers. And I was thinking first, uh, when, the, when one of the audience was talking about a sentence type, I think it's also really important. I mean, uh, for subjective function, maybe one clause is involved, but uh, for textual function, it is more than one clause involved. So I think this is something we need to consider. I'm, I, I'm not sure. I, I thought we needed. That's consider. what I said. Yes, I said there is a textual function which is connective. Yeah, yeah. Which is the, uh, you, you have to connect something with something. It's not yeah. usually a clause. Now you can also connect phrases, of course. But I I've been mainly looking at c connecting uh, clauses. So yes, uh, that is different from yeah. I was saying. Uh, from Gesquier's kind, which are referential, uh, reference tracking. And those are not necessarily used in separate clauses. That's, so I think you're agreeing with me. Yeah. That those yeah. should be yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, I'm, I also agree here, it is, we do not need to have a kind of climb to say it, it, it's kind of direct development from one to the other. I mean, it's more complicated. And yeah. also, yeah, I also agree with you in your book, 2022. Actually, I would say position, uh, sentence media position or initial position of a sentence is also really important. Uh, that could uh, involve different changes. Uh, that, that's my, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm working on that direction. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, the initial slot is not necessarily subjective. The final slot is also not necessarily intersubjective. Uh, a lot of these elements are individual unit specific cases. Now in the case of after all, uh, yes, I spent a lot of time with after all. <laughs> it, it fascinates me because uh, like so many other ones in English, it starts out as an adverbial at the end and it gets to be used. Uh, I'm just checking if the other other questions. I, I probably I think not. Um, it starts out as an adverbial, and it means after everything. I, I got lots of nice examples of, uh, you know, they went to dinner after everything, after some event. Right? Uh, so it starts out as an adverbial. It gets used in the 18th century in three different ways. And by the beginning of 1900, they are very, very distinct. The final is concessive. The initial is a justification. Those are not very far apart because they are about reasoning. Uh, but uh, it, one example, uh, they got married after all. 
that after all at the end would at the end of the 19th century have exclusively meant they got married despite what was expected. Like they're just the same. But at the beginning, after all, they got married. You know, everything's fine. After all, they got married, which is a justification for saying everything's fine. Now, I have not studied it in, in medial position, uh, so I won't say anything about that. Uh, but uh, it's absolutely clear around 1900 that those two different meanings and different slots were what people knew about how to use although, uh, after all. However, by the time you get to the year 2000, there's no distinction. Most people are using it for justification in both positions. So there's nothing to do with the position that will give you the meaning. Now, I think that helps answer somebody else's earlier question. There's nothing in the position that will give you that meaning. However, Lenker, again, very interestingly pointed out that in the 18th century, a whole slew of adverbials in English, like however, uh, and after all, came to be used as concessive. And one of her hypotheses is that at that time, if you were using a discourse marker and you used it in final position, it would mean concessive. Now, if you take that as a strong hypothesis, which she did not intend, which means it's a tendency and it's a possibility, which I could of the, well, the 18th and 19th century, if you put a discourse marker at the end, you were likely to get a concessive meaning. And it's not just the 19th century. Uh, people have talked about but in English, it used to be called Australian but, but it is used a lot <laughs> in various varieties of English, it's final. Uh, I'll finish soon, but well, that but sort of signals end of what I have to say, uh, or signals that there is, uh, despite what you might expect, uh, Mulder and Thompson studied those extensively in 2008, and there's a whole lot of articles about that. Um, so final position and concessive do tend to go together in English. I have no idea whether they do in Chinese, but <laughs> probably not. But it is a case that in English, uh, concessive comes in final position quite often. So, you, was there more you wanted to add to, to what you were saying? I don't think I have other questions. I just don't want to. If, if, uh, I, if I still have time, yeah, if, I still, if, it's, if, it, if it still permits, uh, let me just add a little something. Yeah, uh, there are some. Yeah, I, I have some questions. Yeah. So, so you, you answer questions first, or I just add a little bit? Well, if you have something brief, I, th I think I should go on to some other questions here because time is running out. Yeah. Uh, okay, is there anything you wanted to add? Okay, okay. okay. then I would say something, okay. So, <clears throat> you see, uh, uh, let's just talk about after all again. So, uh, for your after all, uh, for the whole diagonal changes, could you really specify a kind of period that is, uh, that is uniquely for, uh, discourse marking function, and then it is epistemicity. Or 
uh, when I was reading your examples, I really thought it, actually uh, all through the stages uh, when it was using used as a kind, a kind of physical structural remarkers marker, I still I also see the epistemic function, and when it is used as kind of epistemic marker, I still also see the uh, discal structural function. So could you just have um, uh, could you really distinguish? Could you really have, have a kind of period that is uniquely used as kind of discal structural marker? Yeah, that's a question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that I heard everything. The uniquely is was there a period? Yeah. Period. A period of time in the history of English that was unique. Uh, well, there was a period of time that was unique between the development of discourse markers and Peters, uh, his German, Peters, uh, wrote an article back in, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, uh, talking about the way in which these discourse markers appeared uh, in greater profusion than they had before. Uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, Bezalou Loss has related that to the loss of uh, verb second in English, uh, which has to do with information structuring. Uh, so uh, after all appeared around 1700, I don't think there's anything very specific about 1700. It's just when that one occurred. I think I should move on to some other questions because I've just discovered some. Thank you. Um, how do we put individual DSMs into construction networks? By what links? Oh, I guess this is a question from how do you get from a lexical item to a DSM? Well, uh, the way I've done it, it's not ideal, and I think there's a lot uh, that can be worked out there, uh, is that you think about what the structure of the lexical item was, you find out what its contexts were, you show what those contexts were, and then uh, you simply have to model uh, the new structure. I don't know any other way to do it. Um, but in, in a very quantitative and detailed way of doing your work, uh, you can show the context that will actually lead to uh, the new DSM. But you have to read the text very, very carefully and find the context. There's another question here. Can we say synchronically speaking, textuality, subjectivity, and intersubjectivity reflect different cognitive construals? Yeah, I think so. I think underlying mechanism is metaphorical extension across domains. Uh, no, I don't, because I think the metaphorical extension. Well, you have to distinguish between metaphorical extension and metonymic uh, association. And I haven't uh, thought about that. Uh, historically, I think of metaphor as the result of metonymy, but uh, you're asking about synchrony. Uh, it, it might well be. Uh, if it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor for what would be my question. Uh, it's like analogy. You have to say analogy with what. A metaphor is a is a matching, is a pattern. And I'm not sure what it would be a metaphor for. Um, what's the title of the 2014 book you just mentioned? Oh my goodness, I uh, don't know <laughs> what I just mentioned. Uh, I have an extensive uh, bibliography here. Uh, you think, uh, I think it might be, you're thinking of, of the Lenker. It's not a book. Uh, she did write a book in 2010. And just let me, 
because I'm having trouble moving all this stuff around, as you can see. Um, because there is a complete bibliography at the end of the PowerPoint. Let me just uh, link her. The Linker article has a very funny title. It is called Knitting and Splitting Information, Medial Placement of Linking Adverbials in the History of English. That's its title. It's an article in a book edited by Tenninger, P-F-E-N-N-I-G-E-R, Timo Fiva and others. And it's called Contact, Variation, and Change in the History of English. So unless you have access to this PowerPoint, uh, which does have references at the end of it, well, oh, wait, I can scroll down to it. That would be a useful thing to do, wouldn't it? Get there. <laughs> um, Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't cite it, unfortunately, uh, in the PowerPoint. I cited it in discussion because there were all these questions about position. Uh, it's the same person. It's Ursula Lenker. And it's knitting and splitting information, medial placement, of linking adverbials in the history of English in an edited book called Contact, Variation and Change in the History of English, which was published by Benjamins, like most things these days. Uh, oh, someone has, so he's got Ursula Lenka there. Uh, yes, the author is Lenka. If if you're talking about what I said about medial position, it is Ursula Linker. But as I said, it's not, not a book. That one is an article. She did write a book, which is in the which I've used a lot in my thinking. And the book, the 2010 book, uh, is where she talks about. This is a book, the 2010 book. That book is where she talks about the fact that in the 18th century, uh, final discourse markers uh, often were used in con with concessive meaning. It's interesting because it's a very strong hypothesis. It's a very testable hypothesis um, about a link between position and meaning. Uh, it's the closest of anything that I've seen that talks about position and meaning. Uh, here's one. There's one new message. Oh, there, someone put it in. Thank you very, very, very much. That's it. It's a very difficult title to cite because, as you see, a lot of those people have names that are spelled in odd kinds of ways. Hi, Professor Togod. I guess we have the last question about just the same there. Okay, let's see where I can find it. Oh, it can be used as a courtesy subject. Yes, it's not as frequent, but there is a formula, thank you all the same, and thank you all the same means, I thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> and thank you just the same, it's the same. It means thank you, but no thank you. It's a rejection of what is offered, yes. 
Okay. They're very, very similar. And that's why I think there may have been some analogy going on there. Uh, but all the same as the earlier one, about 50 years earlier. And they're not quite the same, I think, in British and American English. Hi, Tina. Let's make it the, la the very last question. <laughs> yes, that's it. So thank you, Professor Trogott, for your detailed and patient answer for all those questions. So we may spend another minute to... I, I send the microphone to Thomas. Thomas, do you want to say something? I would like to invite the audience to uh, join us to thank Professor Chogot. Yes. And if so, you are, yeah. if you are, if you can, if you are uh, okay to, you know, turn on your your camera, you are welcome to do so. I mean, all of us. And uh, let's give us, uh, let's give Professor Chogot a big <laughs> applaud. Yes. Well, thank so you. Thank you, to thank you Professor Lee, for inviting me to give this talk. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the questions. They're going to set me thinking about, they have set me thinking uh, about several important issues. And uh, if some of you have questions that you think about later, that often happens, you're most welcome to send me an email, and I will try to answer it. I think you have my... Uh, my email, it was there on the very first page. It's trialgot at stanford.edu. Oh, I'm sorry, it seemed to have disappeared, but anyway. We have your email on, on our website. Yeah, good, all right. Well, well thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. This is the end of the seventh innovation talk in linguistics. So let's thank Professor Trogol again, and thank you all for joining us in this wonderful morning. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, have, have a good day, rest of the day. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your night. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.